Good morning, evening, night, weekend, 10 minutes before class, whenever you're watching this video. This is part two of our History of Forensic Science lecture. In the first video, we talked about kind of early history of forensic science. Um, it wasn't really science, but more people uh, doing things um, ahead of their time and using a scientific fashion to do so. Uh, and so now we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, the history of it from the 1700s on. Uh, we definitely won't be able to hit everything, uh, but we'll do our best. I would suggest taking notes, um, seeing that uh, you're going to have a quiz over it. I put some video lectures up and tutorials on um, how to do Cornell notes, which are a fantastic way of organizing your thoughts. First thing, let's look at our objective. Our lecture objective is that we're going to recognize the major contributors to the development of forensic science, and then in class we'll actually illustrate the history of forensic science. But keep our objectives in mind that you need to recognize the major contributors. So that's what we're going to jump into. First major contributor is Carl Wilhelm Scheele. Okay, 1775, he was a German chemist. He developed the first uh, known test uh, for arsenic, okay, being able to detect uh, the presence of arsenic in corpses. Um, this was a pretty big deal. Arsenic is a really just a nasty element uh, and generally used because of its toxic properties and so he was able to develop a test for it. It's a little fun fact in 1786 a guy by the name of John Toms uh, was one of the first people convicted uh, you by the use of physical matching where evidence was matched and, and led to him. See back in the day um, the bullet for a gun didn't necessarily match the caliber wise so that gun wasn't calibrated to the gun and so for there to be a good seal for you to have compression and or for a bullet to be able to actually fire um, people would take things so what they called wadding sometimes even just like a piece of paper and they would pack that around the bullet when they put it into the gun so that there would be compression and it would fire uh, and so um, John Tom's the paper that he used was actually matched you know to the paper that he had actually in his pocket of, at the time of the crime um, because he had just torn it off of that piece of paper, so they were able to match that to him, and he was convicted. Valentin Ross, 1806 German chemist, um, he also discovered a more precise method for developing, uh, for detecting, excuse me, small amounts of arsenic. Um, we'll actually look at a couple of different things that have to do with this arsenic, whereas we go be able to get uh, more and more precise in our data. However, something seems wrong in my. Uh, lecture here so far. We're talking about all these historical figures. Um, look at this guy. He's looking all dapper. I feel a little bit underdressed. So let me go ahead and let me fix that. All right. It's a good look for me, right? Okay. Matthew Orfea, 1814. We have Spain here. He is the father of forensic toxicology. He wrote one of the most important works on, um, on toxicology. Uh, and really made it a legitimate science and so um, we owe a lot uh, to him and his work. William Nickel, 1828, huge discovery, invented the polarized light microscope which we still use obviously in a much more updated fashion uh, but this was huge on being able to uh, be able to see things on a microscopic level. Now 11 years later because of Nickel's discovery and his invention uh, we have Henri Louise Bayard who formulated the first procedures for microscopic sperm detection Okay, of being able to actually look at a slide and see sperm grow up. Um, but uh, this was huge, especially when you start talking about um, the last 50 to 100 years of, of you know, with rape cases and just being able to um, being able to actually see biological evidence that you cannot see with just your eyes. And so this was a, a huge breakthrough. Here. James Marsh, we have a Swedish, or excuse me, a Scottish chemist in 1839. Um, he was the first person to testify using toxo toxicological. That's a hard word. Everybody say that five times fast. Toxicological. Okay. Um, used uh, toxicological evidence in a case, and so we start to see the merging of science and law, which is forensic science and criminalistics. Those things all blend together. Two important things to know, 1863 was the first time that the presumptive blood test was developed, okay, where you can actually determine if something was blood. And then in 1850s and 60s, you start to see um, more improved records, especially in the prison system, uh, and you start to see developments in photography and being able to actually 
um, record what's taking place in a crime scene. Okay. All right. Very important. Okay. Make sure that you have notes on this. Alphonse Bertillon. Okay. 1879. He was a French anthropologist. Introduced something called the Bertillon system. But it's more properly known in how we will refer to it in class as anthropometry. Okay. Basically, this was the first widely used identification program. And oh, let me use my stash here for a second. Oh, hold on. Actually, let's just do that. All right. Forget it. All right. Um, where a series of measurements were taken. Actually, I think I have a little slide here. You can't see that probably too well, but a series of measurements were taken. Um, and these measurements were thought to be completely unique to you. Okay, so there would be, you know, I think in this instance here, we have nine different measurements, talking about head measurements, arm length, um, and so these measurements were used to identify a person. However, this worked relatively well. I mean, it's a lot of data to hold on to until a particular case that happened in 1903. Very interesting. A, uh, in, Leaven, in the Leavenworth, Kansas prison system, a guy by the name of Will West gets put into prison. Well, the person who is processing him, the clerk who's processing Will West as he goes through, is like, man, have you ever been in prison before? And Will West is like, no, I've never been in prison. Well, see, this really bugs the clerk because he knows he has seen this guy before. I mean, he and so uh, he goes through the records and actually finds out that there is another person in that prison by the name of William West. So you have Will West and William West. Well, the thing is, is that look down at the at the picture there. They look nearly identical. And the, when you did there. Um, the whole anthropometry and, and put them through the Bertillon system, their measurements were nearly identical. Okay, And so you have two guys who have the same name, have the same physical appearance, and have the same measurements. This was basically destroyed the Bertillon system of being widely used for identification, and only after this, actually about a year or so later, um, did the prison system start to look uh, more heavily at fingerprint identification uh, because uh, this one kind of went out the window. How they're still, still don't know the whole history and, and mystery of the whole Will West thing. There's thoughts that maybe perhaps they were related, maybe they were even brothers and didn't know it, but there's even more pictures that I can, uh, I'll, I might show you on another time where they really do look exactly alike. Anyway, so that's the end of anthropometry and the beginning of fingerprints. Okay, very important case. Um, Hans Gross, 1893, um, Austrian prosecutor judge, he published um, a book called Criminal Investigation. And so this basically was the first wide um, scoped textbook on forensic science and criminalistics, okay, where it talks about the benefits of science, microscopy, um, chemistry, physics, zoology, botany, everything. Okay, uh, including fingerprints. So this was this right here was was pretty much the um, kind of a watershed moment for forensic science because this is still considered uh, a very important work. Two guys, Carl Landsteiner, um, in 1901 discovered uh, blood typing. Okay, if you know your particular blood type, then that's because of Carl Landsteiner. Then Albert Osborne in 1910 published a book called Questioned Documents. Okay, this uh, this particular uh, book is still referenced uh, when with uh, determining document forgeries. Okay, so even you know over a hundred years later, this work still actually stands up uh, for being able to determine forged question documents. Okay, another important guy. Almost, I would say probably even more so important than uh, Bertillon because uh, we will be this right here actually forms a really a, a heavy framework for forensic science. Edmond Locard, okay, uh, we have his, his dates there, he's a French doctor and criminologist, okay, this guy also, as I described him, is a grade A ninja. Locard's exchange principle is foundational to forensic science. Basically, the, the, fir the thought with Locard's exchange principle is any time two things make contact, there is an exchange of material. 
okay? Uh, and so if I am, you know, walking and bump into a table, there is an exchange of material, maybe even on a microscopic level, okay? Um, or you have two people are fighting. You have an exchange of, of material that takes place. And so that's the whole, the whole thought of any time two objects, no matter what they are, come in contact. You have something that, that is exchanged between the two. Um, and so Locard, I mean, the guy was, was, was legendary in a lot of ways. Um, he was able to, like, one case that I can, that I can think of was um, there was a case of, that involved some possibly forged coins. Okay, where there were people who were forging coins. And they had three suspects. Uh, and so Locard, no one could solve the case, so he said, bring me those suspects, bring me the clothes they were wearing at the time that they were arrested. And so he was able to take the clothes that they were wearing, and he searched it over and was able to find microscopic sized, I say microscopic, really, really, really entirely small um, uh, metal fragments that he was able to actually to match to the coins that were being counterfeited and they were convicted. Okay. He opened the first crime lab in France. Okay. Basically, it was just like an attic with a microscope in it, but over time, he was able to build up a lot of resources, but this was huge, first crime laboratory um, that we really know of. Walter uh, Macron, um, all throughout the 1900s, uh, he was the leading uh, expert in uh, microscopes. Okay. Um, he was, uh, was great at um, determining if documents were real or not. Um, I mean, he, anyways, the guy was it was just brilliant, and he really pushed along that field of microscopy as an American chemist. Now let's talk about crime labs. Uh, the history of crime labs. Yeah, 1923, Los Angeles. It says Los Angeles. Copy and paste there. Um, they built the first crime lab in the United States. wasn't exactly top notch at the time, but it was the only one that was there in the 30s. Uh, University of Cal California at Berkeley developed their Department of Criminalistics. In 1932, the FBI finally created their first major lab. The FBI's labs are actually world class now, obviously. Um, and then about 50 years later in 1981, we have a really big thing happen. Um, the FBI opens a Forensic Science Research and Training Center and they open up five labs across the country. These would be the FBI lab in Quantico. The DEA lab, um, you have the ATF lab, okay, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and uh, U.S. Army Crime Lab, and the U.S. Postal Inspection Service lab. Okay, these were all opened in 1981 to be able to process for these different agencies. A big time there. Uh, also, I mean, when we talk about crime labs abroad, there's a bunch more, but the British Home Office has their um, Metropolitan Police Lab in London with other regional labs, and then in Canada. You've got the uh, good old Mounties. They have their lab. Uh, they have a Center of Forensic Science in Toronto and the Institute of Legal Medicine and Police Science in Montreal. Okay, so we come back. We need to recognize the major contributors to the development of forensic science. You need to know people like Scheele and Gross and Bertillon and Locard. Like you need to to be able to recognize what did they actually contribute to the development of forensic science. Take good notes. See you in class. The end.